You've reached Conversation with Mr. A. This is your host, Anthony Apostilla. Thank you for listening. Let's get right to the episode. One, hey, welcome to another edition of Conversations with Mr. A. This is your host, Anthony Abastilla. And so for this edition, I have Mr. Angel Bolido uh, for this um, for this wonderful episode we're going to be doing. Thank you, Angel, for being here. Thank you for having me, brother. So, um, Angel, um, uh, for starters, it's a Veterans Day, and I just wanted to say again, thank you for your service. Um which branch of the military did you serve, and for how long? Uh, I served in the United States Navy for 35 years. Wow, 35 years. Um, can you tell our listeners what position you were in and then what your duties, what it entailed? Well, in the, the Reader's, Reader's Digest version of that would be, uh, was 35 years, you know, went boot camp, went to A school. After that, I went to uh, uh, aviation mechanics school. After aircraft mechanic school, then I got stationed in Roosevelt Roads, Puerto Rico, Sicanella, Sicily. I was a Navy recruiter. Then I went to um, A6 Intruder Squadron as an aircraft mechanic. Then I became an instructor. Then after that, I got commissioned, made chief petty officer, and then made comm- my uh, mate officer. And then after that, I got stationed in numerous, numerous squadrons. And I ended up doing 35 years, retired as a commander. Wow. Wow. That is amazing. That, that just sounds... Wow, quite the career. Um, I'll start from the beginning. And so, um, what uh, first? How did you get started? Like, what what first brought you into the um the navy? Uh, I guess I was like fourteen years old. My uh, my uh, I will say what is the word in English? I'm trying to find it. My cuñado, which is your father-in-law, <laughs> Orlando. <laughs> He joined okay. the military, and uh, I kind of looked up to what he did and uh, the situation. I was looking at my future and I said, you know what? Uh, I don't think I'm going to be hanging around in Puerto Rico, go to college, even though I had the, the chance to go with the Pell Grant and go free college and everything. But I knew, you know, in Puerto Rico, it was a lot of politics and things, so I knew I wasn't going to get, you know, far enough if I uh, stayed in the island. So I decided then, I was 14 years old, so I'm going to do just like he did. I'm going to join the Navy. And uh, um, it was an easy decision. It was an easy decision for my mom. It was not. A, it was a great decision. My dad could not wait for me to get out of the house, <laughs> but it was because I, I was, uh, I was ransacking his pantry and the refrigerator. You know, <laughs> wow. He wanted me to leave. <laughs> Other than huh. that, but they, uh, they had to sign for me because I was 17 years old when I joined. Uh, my, my mind was made up. I want to go in the navy and. Uh, I wanted to be an aircraft mechanic, and, and that was it. The, the rest was history. I was a senior in high school, but after I Puerto Rico, the classes starts in August. I immediately went to the recruiting station, took my test, passed, barely made it because it was in English, of course, and English is my second language. Made it, got the physical, and signed up and waited nine and a half months to get in after I graduated. Nine and a half months, wow. Wow. Uh, when you got in, I was going to ask you, uh, with the boot camp experience, how was the boot camp experience, the initial the initial getting in? Okay. <laughs> you want to start laughing. Uh, Uh-oh. Well, it was very interesting. You know, a young, young teenager coming from Puerto Rico, not speaking the language that well, other than with the teacher in Puerto Rico at the time. You know, the teacher, this is a door, this is the, this is the window, this is the blue, this is red, you know. The kind of stuff they don't never teach you conversational English. So, just imagine, uh, here I am in Orlando, Florida. They, they, I still remember the price of the ticket. Ninety nine dollars. Hold on one second. I'm sorry. Sorry about that. Should have put it on mute. But anyway, uh, no problem. Uh, I jumped in the in book at ninety nine dollars. A one way one way trip. I was crying like a baby. You know, because, you know, the fear of the unknown, leaving my mom and my dad, so I was crying like a baby. Uh, one one uh, anecdote that was very, very, uh, very funny about it, it was uh, Puerto Rico just had like a missed, missed uh, 
Latin America concert or uh, contest, you know, this pageant or something. And there was, I, I remember it was Miss Costa Rica was sitting right beside me and saw me crying and everything and asked me. And then I told her what was up. You know, it was a short conversation. Landing in Orlando, uh, as soon as I landed in Orlando, they all tell you just the clothes you got on and a little duffel bag or a little, you know, overnight bag with your clothes and toiletries. And they have all these company commanders, what they call it, you know, sailors around the airport looking for lost puppies like me. And they saw me and they pointed at me and, and you just can tell. We're talking about 1978. Okay, that's when the military was rough around the edges. They call me all kinds of filthy names and get in the effing bus. <laughs> I can only imagine the feeling. I, I'm just trying to picture the feeling back in 1978. Oh, my Lord. It, it was, leaving, it was, yeah, just leaving. Leaving Puerto Rico and this coming in, fear of the I unknown, know. and just coming across um, some pretty rough individuals, I'd imagine. Well, yes, because they, they get in your faces and screaming. First of all, I don't know what they, well, I know they're saying bad words and curse words and everything. I just didn't know what they were saying. And tell me to, you know, shut the F up and sit on that, on that bus. And you have all these guys around me that didn't speak Spanish. The bus is full of all kinds of, you know, races, colors, creeds everywhere. And I was the only, I was the only Spanish speaking guy there. Just imagine. And I was wow. scared. Wow. Very scared. Yeah. So the, the, I can, <laughs> I can only imagine, um, how were things as things progressed? So, um, you started um, just as you went on through the boot camp. Did they, when did things start to, I don't want to say improve, but when when did you start to kind of get used to things? Uh, well, it didn't take long because uh, the, the hardest part was trying to get used to the, la you know, the language barrier, trying to understand things. Uh, it, it was rough, but I, I got used to the military discipline. I got used to, you know, a certain schedule. You know, I... I when I was a teenager, I was trying to hustling. I was trying to make a dollar. So I was always willing to get up early and work and do whatever it takes to make one dollar in Puerto Rico. So that was easy. The hardest part was trying to go through all the schools and, and what they teach you because of the language barrier, you know. Uh, so just give you an example. For example, uh, when I was in boot camp, uh, they tell you how to fold clothes because when you're on board a ship, when you go on board a ship, space is limited. When you're enlisting men, there's not much room for anything. So what they do is they give you this little locker and these little items, you know, like three shirts, three underwears, a little bit of everything. And you got to know how to fold it and put it in the locker because the space is limited on board the ship when you go. So uh, they would tell me, okay, when they start folding the towel, they say, okay, this is the catch edge. This is the garbage chain. The garbage chain goes inside the locker. Don't let the garbage chain show up. So I just heard garbage. So what would I do? I would just grab the grab the towel and put it in the garbage can. You know what I mean? So oh my! Yeah. It was one of those. <laughs> it was one of those things, that, and people laugh at me and everything. And I'm looking. I'm getting mad and angry because now I'm getting punished. And not only not only that, because I'm getting punished, everybody else get punished because they were supposed to be a team and, and help me out. So, but I got I got used to the the the, the process. You know, being in the navy. You know, it was it was really nice. It was. It didn't get me long, take too long to uh, get used to it. And I was going to ask, um, you mentioned earlier, um, it sounded like you worked your way up through the ranks just kind of slowly and surely. How, how um, that's pretty incredible. I was going to ask how that, uh, how how did you do that? Because, I mean, not everyone, from what I know, seems to go up those ranks just like that, up to commander. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a very unique uh, situation. My My thing was, I would look at the pay chart <laughs> when I was starting in and I was working 12 hours on, no weekends off, working on airplanes, all greased up and working. And now we'll see the division officer, the commander, and all these guys going to play golf at noon or what on a Friday. And I said, I want that. And then I look at the pay chart. Nice. What I, <laughs> yeah, what I was making and what they were making, I said, wait a minute. You know, I, it's got to be a way. So, you know, there in the Navy, there's so much opportunity. Just like in the U.S., there's opportunities. They teach you how to study for the test. What's the bibliography is? What questions they're going to ask and what subjects? So if you know your, if you know your job, you know if you know your regulations and you study, there's no problem. And I study, I study. You know, when I went for E4, E5, and E6, 
and uh, may I made rank. I made like, and within five years and ten months in the Navy, I was already in E six, and, and that's kind of unheard of. Yeah, we just moved up, but uh, when when you go up a little bit in rank and you're gonna go to the chief level, chief petty officer, which you're like a technical expert when you're a chief petty officer. So that I got stuck, just because I was too young, and depending on the uh, what. Uh, Specialty you are in the military in the navy, is there's a window of opportunity to make rank. So in my case, the window to make chief E seven was fourteen to sixteen years, and look at me, I already made first class at five, almost six, and I would not have a chance to go for chief until I was nine years in the navy. So it's impossible to make E seven at that time. So I just kept, you know, kept trying, kept trying, kept trying. I went for chief. I tried for chief petty officer seven times, and the seventh time, I have 15 years, and I make chief petty officer. At the same time, I was looking for an opportunity to get commissioned so I could move up. So what I did was I applied for this program called the Limited Duty Officer Program. And you just put a package. It's based on your merits and what you've done. And if you are good enough, if you make the cut, you know, they'll make you an officer. You know, And they'll send you through a crash course how to be an officer, and you go from there. But you're former enlisted with the Navy called Mustangs. They call us Mustangs. You get like a certain privilege for being prior enlisted. And you, you know the ropes, so you get a lot of respect. So I that sounds like for quite the, the yeah. journey. Yeah, I applied for LDO in uh, four four times. The fourth time I made it, I made E seven of fifteen years, and then I got commissioned as a limited duty officer as an aviation maintenance officer. Uh, about 17 years in the Navy. And then from there, I served another 18 years as an officer. And, uh, wow. and then you get keep making rank, keep making rank. You get your checks in the block. You do your education. You know, the, uh, thanks to the Navy, I was able to get my bachelor's degree, my master's degree, all paid for by the military. You know, and then uh, all kinds of different qualifications, certifications. And you do what you're supposed to. You do your, your job right and you get promoted. And ended up being uh, what they call an 05, which is a commander in the Navy, equivalent to a lieutenant colonel in the Air Force or the Marines or the Army. Wow. Um, <clears throat> one thing I wonder, uh, throughout the journey, so from boot camp through rising up the ranks, uh, my question is building relationships. I, I'd imagine you had to deal with a whole bunch of people. I mean, you mentioned a little bit with boot camp, <laughs> but um, I'm also thinking – um, people you built com camaraderie with. Uh, can you explain a little bit the you know the experiences, just building the relationships and building the connections? And are you still friends with some of them today? Oh yes, we, there are some people that are still you know that I, I still I mean as a matter of fact today's Veterans Day, my phone has been blowing up with Happy Veterans Day from all kinds of people that I haven't talked to in, in years. But it's just one of those things. Uh, all it takes is one text, and then you know you're on the same page. You know what I mean? So all these years come back, and it's like you never forgot about them. Uh, when I when I first joined the Navy, you know, coming from Puerto Rico, I was a dark-skinned guy with a big afro. I wish it in the picture. <laughs> so I kind of, I, the the black guys, you know, when I say, you know, there was no racism at all. But I never felt there was any, but the, the black guys kind of felt sorry for me because of the position I was, you know, so they kind of took me in. And the funniest thing that it was is that uh, by the time I finished boot camp, I was just talking with a jive, you know what I mean? It was like weird that I, that, that's how I learned English, conversational English with all the, uh, all the black people, all the black boys that were there. That was just, it was great. We're camaraderie. I make friends with everybody. I didn't have any issues. Uh, it was a very diverse Navy. And, and, and w w what I'm telling you is we don't see any any color, any race, any religion in the military. God. At least with the way I did my 35 years, we see past through that. Well, I just wanted somebody that was in my team who was willing to get the job done and defend this country. That's all we want. We were not looking at anything else. So it was very easy to establish relationships with anybody Male or female, whether creed, race, no matter what, it was great. Remarkable, no, remarkable. Um, I, I have another question I'm wondering: as you uh, eventually became leaderships, because I'm assuming, of course, you got into leadership positions. 
Um, mm-hmm. What wasn't hard as a leader sometimes um, dealing with the different personalities? Because I'd imagine some were kind of just had their own way of thinking and, you know, reining people in. Was that a challenge for you? Yeah, it was. It was very challenging because, you know, you got to consider, you know, if you're talking to a female, uh, if you're talking to a male, you know, uh, you have to be very careful when it comes in. Now you have to treat them with a with, with white gloves. It's just uh, the military is firm and fair. You know, you uh, orders are orders. You know, if I give you an order to get this done, you get it done. There's there's no, you know, personalities. There's nothing there. You know, the, the job is to launch an aircraft off the pony end on an aircraft carrier. You go get it done. I don't care how you do it. As long as you do it safely, I don't want to hear it. Uh, but the end, you do have to take into consideration uh their their backgrounds and everything you know uh they are some some uh there were so many programs in the navy that as you become a leader they they send you to those schools you know, call opportunity schools uh you know race relations they send you to uh they even give you personality tests you know things like that so you you know where where to where to draw the line when it comes to treating with other people and then you and, and the main thing is as long as you treated them with respect, because there are some people, there were some people that they were in leadership position that were not the greatest leaders ever, to the point that I will say, I will never be like that guy if I ever become a leader. You know what I mean? Coercive, you know, very coercive, you know, kind of dictator-like. Uh, no, I was that a very... fun. Yeah, I was a very uh, democratic kind of guy. I took everybody's uh, opinions and... and like if I was gonna make a decision, I would brought the chiefs in, in, the supervisors, and they'll tell me, okay, what what would you do in my situation? What would be the best plan? I just want you know, give me one, two, and three. What would happen with one of those three? What would be the repercussions? And then make a decision on that. So they all felt included, whether the decision was made by me, and that's what decision I made. At least I give everybody the opportunity to voice what was the best recommendation, and that's how you keep camaraderie. That's how you keep everybody together. Wow. Um, now, I imagine over the years, um, eventually uh, made a family, you know, um, have kids. Um, what were the challenges that you had uh, being in the military, but also managing the family life? Family separation is a big thing. You know, you get deployed. You know, you spend holidays, Christmas, birthdays away. Uh, I was I was married one at one point. And that marriage uh, dissolved, you know, and I, I can attest there was a lot of issues when it comes, you know, family separation deployments. You know, you have your career ahead and you're trying to move up, you know, so it was a little rough. And But then the second time around and everything turned around for good and uh, ended up uh, raising two more children. So I have Christina Maria, my oldest Maria. Our little, our middle was Christine, which is our, my, my, all smaller daughter, but uh, then when I married Barbara, uh, which has now been 20 years, you know, also a military wife, you know, because she was also an ex-military wife as well. Uh, so we kind of bonded, ended up, you know, 20, we just celebrated our 20 year anniversary and there's still congratulations. Thank you. Still separation, still holidays. Same thing that happened with Marie and Christine. Uh, now with Roman and Adrian, the same thing. So you just, the, the the main thing is that is it's like the tell us in the navy you have to balance career, duty station and family. You have to grab the tripod, right? You, if you think about a, a table with three legs, or a tripod, you gotta bring that tripod. When you close it, they all have to kind of come in the middle. You know, if you put career before family, you know, in in duty station, more likely it's not gonna work. If you put duty station before family, career is not gonna work. If you put family first. And career in duty station, you're not. It's not going to be successful. So you need to bring the three elements together, and you try the best you can to put it in the middle, and that's what you base your decisions on. And of course, faith in God, you know, in, in a lot of prayer. That's you can't go wrong with it. Um, I would imagine uh, things had to be different when you left the military and transitioned to civilian life. Um, what were some of the challenges that you faced when you left the military, when you finished? Well, it was tough because uh, I, I had a great retirement ceremony uh, in Pax River. Then I was stationed at Pax River, Maryland. As a matter of fact, 
the last two years of my military career, I was by myself. I just left. I left my wife, Barbara, and, and at the time, Adrian, because Roman, I think it was gone already. And uh, so I made that decision because I didn't want her to move to Pax River. And I didn't want to displace the children from the child from, from school. So we decided to, you're going to make it work. And I was like what we call in the Navy a uh, geographical bachelor. So the past two years, I was in Patuxent River, Maryland, four hour ride from Virginia Beach. So I used to leave on the weekends. Like on a Monday morning, I would leave and I come back on a Friday and I would work up there the whole week. So that was kind of tough. Uh, but it made it easy for me to retire and make the transition because I was tired of being away, you know, uh, and being in a, in a different state and everything. Uh, the, but the weirdest thing was after my retirement ceremony, the following the the following Monday, when we left that weekend, the following Monday I got up in the morning. Uh, at the time, uh, my wife Barbara worked. You know, she was a uh, she was working as a radiation therapist in Chesapeake as a radi- cancer radiation therapist. I woke up in the morning, she went to work, and I just sat in that couch, turned the TV on, and it was like, what do I do now? <laughs> I mean, and they, it, had and they, to be a, it had to be quite the experience thinking, what, yeah, yeah. Like, what now? Yeah, because the week before my retirement, I was still having my relief. I was still trying to teach him, hey, this is what you do. I was working on emails, making phone calls, introducing him to everybody. All that rush, 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 work, work, work. And it went like from 100 miles an hour to zero. And it was like quiet. Two different extremes. Quiet. <laughs> Two it different was me extremes. And the, me and the dog. That was it. <laughs> and my, my wife uh, was going to work. So it was weird. It was very weird. And uh, so it was it was like a – and I didn't know what to do about it at the time. Uh, I, you know, they, in the military, that's a good thing. They sent you to uh, retirement seminars and things and resume writing. I mean, the military just equips you with everything you need. You have to make the – you know, you, it's up to you to go out there and get a job. But uh, I wasn't ready to start working right away. <laughs> I didn't want to do nothing. As a matter of fact, I let my hair grow long. Uh-huh. Almost down to my – Oh, that's my shoulders. People thought I was Hawaiian. They said, Are you oh, wow. I said, no, I'm Puerto Rican. And uh, all I did was go to the gym and let my hair grow and and uh, take care of my my, uh, my wife, Barbara, at the time. I just uh, just took care of her. Didn't do nothing. Clean the house, cook. I was having a good old time. <laughs> I can't blame you after all yeah. those years. Now, yeah. now, I know you mentioned, now, I mean, I know you mentioned this in the very beginning. Um, can you um, tell our listeners uh, what you're doing today and how things are now? Okay, well, what I'm doing today, uh, after a few years, you know, working part-time for the corporate world, uh, I decided to run into a good friend of mine and offer me a job with the federal government as a contract administrator. That was back in 2016, three years after I retired, and I went ahead and took it. So since then, I'm uh, I'm, I'm working as a, well, I first started as a project management analyst, a project management analyst first, the first three years working with the government. And then I saw an opportunity to go to contracts. And so I went to contract administration and went through all the training, went through all the schools. And ever since then, I mean, I'm a contract administrator with a defense contract management agency. And all I do is manage contracts. Uh, I have about 43 contractors that I work with. I manage about $8.9 billion worth of contracts. Uh, wow. Uh, yeah, about 300 contracts altogether. I just administer them, you know, make sure that the I's are dotted, the T's are crossed, people are getting paid, uh, companies are getting paid, they're delivering what they're supposed to deliver, you know, things like that. It's very interesting work. And I'm still serving the government, which is great. As a matter of fact, the other day they gave me a 40-year pin. I said, why you give me a 40-year pin? It's not because you did 35 years with the U.S. Navy, which is 35 years of government service. And you've done over five with us, so they gave me a 40 year pin. So I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds like uh, things picked up from, uh, you mentioned 100 to zero, then it's like, oh, all right, back in business again. Yeah, back, back in business. Back not, not, yeah, not to the point that I mean, I work remotely now, which has been a blessing. When COVID hit, uh, they didn't tell, they didn't want us to go to the office, you know, because there was a lot of turmoil. Nobody knew what was going on. Uh, but we were not ready. The government was, at least our agency, was not ready for remote work and telework. 
we had some trials and tribulations for two for two months. It was like, what are we doing? Uh, but finally, slowly but surely, you know, they kicked in. IT people kicked in, uh, and then made us made us work tele you know teleworkers. And then last year, uh, not this year, I think they yeah finally we all became full time remote workers. So I work from home, you know. So I I can go anywhere I want as long as I got my I got my government laptop with me, and you know, and we just whenever I go, I can do my job, which is great. As long as there's awesome. internet or, or access to the internet, if there's no access, I can't go. <laughs> like That's if fair. I go to your if I go to Europe, I I gotta take vacation or something. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. Um, so a uh, question I have, uh, just going back just a little bit, you know, what what advice would you give to uh, younger folks who Maybe they're fresh out of high school. They want to join the military, the Navy, or maybe people in their early 20s. What advice would you, uh, what would you tell them? You know, what I would tell them is, if, uh, you know, the military is a, is a very honorable organization. No matter what armed force you join, it builds character. It teaches you leadership. It, it teaches you uh, how to get along with others. It teaches you everything. Uh, work ethic, it, it's amazing. It, it is rough. You know, don't get me wrong. All these young kids. Teenagers in the early twenties that want to join the military, uh, my my advice is to them is to, you know, prepare for a little bit of a rough start, which is because we have to we have to transition you from your ways as a civilian into a military person. And uh, you know, there's the 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 uh, it ain't like your rights are violated. It's just like your job is to serve a con- your country. And when you raise your hand, you say you're going to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States, and that's what comes first. Everything else comes last. That's that's your number one mission in the world is to defend your Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And then it goes by saying to bear true faith and allegiance to the same and to obey all the orders from the President of the United States, no matter who it is, okay, in all officers appointed over me. And that's the way it is. If you go by that, you won't get go wrong. But the, the you can build a career. You can do twenty years of military service. You will you be you can get your free education. The the Navy will pay for your college. You know they'll pay for your transfer. If you get married, you get allowances. There's military housing privileges. There's all kinds of things to make your life a little better. But the, the benefit is, you figure, you don't join when you're 18 or 19. You do 20 years in the military. When you're retired, you are you are fully equipped to tackle on any job. doesn't matter. You'll be 38, 39, 40 years old, getting a pension for the rest of your life. Okay? And now you can start another career somewhere else, whether it is with the federal government or the private sector. You can't beat that. You can't beat oh, that. That sounds like yes. That definitely sounds amazing. Yeah. Um, now, uh, Angel, we're uh, getting close to the end of the interview, and uh, uh-huh. what I usually do at the very end is, and this is a fun one. Um, I call it word association, and so I'll give you like one or two words, and uh-huh. um, just tell me the first thing that comes to mind. And this is just more for fun. This is just a uh, lighthearted okay. fun things. Okay. Um, now I know all of our uh, longtime listeners know that I have a strong dislike for pickles and so uh the first thing i'll start with is pickles what, what's the first thing comes to mind when you when you hear the word pickles a, a bitter face <laughs> bitter. <laughs> okay bitter. all right um let's see how about another one how about rap music oh awesome great music love it okay uh country music certain songs Sad. okay <laughs> okay um junk food Oh man, that is good stuff. I feel like it's good stuff. <laughs> good stuff. <laughs> All right. Uh how about this? How about uh politics? Politics. Love politics. Um uh, set me up. <laughs> Love okay. it. Okay. Okay. Um horror movies. Love horror movies. Love them. Any particular favorites? Uh the the slasher, you know, the Real gory slasher movies, the best horrors. Okay. Uh, romantic movies. Love romantic movies. I Sometimes I get a little emotional with them. <laughs> we'll share a tear here and there. Okay. 
Uh, how about bad hygiene? Oh, yuck. The, the bad hygiene, the, don't like it at all. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, laziness. Laziness. I love laziness. I love to be lazy. Love laziness. I love to be lazy. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, how about yoga? Never tried it, but it's painful. I associate pain with it. <laughs> okay. Uh, boxing. Love boxing. I, sign me up for that. Love it. Okay. Uh, WWE. Oh, man. You just took me back. Man, oh, man. I love I, I love WWE. I loved it when it was, you know, the old days. You know, the Four Horsemen, you know, uh, Ric Flair, Jimmy the Fly, Snooker, you know. That's my Andre language, the man. Giant. I mean, that's, that was like the good old days, man. It, it ain't the same now, as, you know, but I still like it. But I, I like the old style, old school wrestling. That's speaking my language right there. <laughs> uh, how, how about video games? No, don't like video games. I, and the reason is because I'm, I'm too old to, to wear those controllers. Too many buttons. Okay. Uh, sports cars. I like sports cars, yeah. Not not much into sports cars, but uh, yeah, I do like sports cars. Okay. Uh, how about one more? How about uh, social media? Social media. Uh, like and dislike. Uh, like when it's all, you know, fair and square and it's good. But when it's uh, detrimental to the, the moral welfare of children and, and, and people, you know, I don't like it that way. Fair. Um, okay. Um, uh, we're at the end of the interview. Um, Angel, is there anything that you would like to tell our listeners to close out? All I'm saying is, uh, thank a veteran if you see one. Uh, they are there. They they went out there. If, whether they did four years, twenty years, ten years, they they uh, it's only one percent of the whole population that joins the military and do their time. So thank a veteran, and never never ever ever forget to uh, put God first. Uh, uh, family second and country last. All right. Thank you, Angel, for your time. Uh, and by the way, thank you for your service, too, on Veterans Day. I very much appreciate your service. Well, thank you, Anthony. Thank you for the chance to uh, talk to you guys. Right. Take care. Okay. God bless. Bye. Um, bye. And that concludes this edition of Conversa Conversation with Mr. A with Angel Belito. Wow. Just going up the ranks, quite the experiences on hell that you went through. Thank you so much for sharing your stories with our listeners, and uh, thank you for your service. Uh, thank you for listening, everyone. More episodes to come.